If you're able to stand, please join me in the call to worship. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you have no money. Come, buy and eat. God, our souls thirst for you. Our flesh fades for you as dry and weary land. Why do you labor and spend your money on things that don't satisfy? We go out and seek out the sanctuary. Listen carefully to me. Eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. Come, let us worship.
There is so much that clamors for our attention. Friends, family, work, classes, household chores, and the noise. We are bombarded with sound. Where is the time and place to listen for the still, small voice of God? Sometimes it seems that God would have to speak in a whirlwind to be heard above the clamor. Listen now. There is a place of quiet rest, and it is the place where God dwells within you. Close your eyes. Be aware of the place. In Lent, we journey to the part of ourselves known only to God, beneath the clamor. Let the story of Jesus reach us there. As we extinguish this light, we acknowledge the darkness and pain of violence in the world. Please join with me in prayer. Draw us together in your love, O God. May our restless hearts continue to search until they find their rest in you. Amen. Peace and the love of God be with you. Please welcome one another and introduce yourself to the person you don't know. Go right ahead. Good morning. It's a beautiful morning, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. How many of you go to school? You'll go to school too when you get older. Some of you will. Yes. And well, how many of you have? Do you have any friends that don't go to church? How many have friends that don't go to church? Yeah, and you know they don't go to church any place, huh? Yeah. You know what God would want us to know and what I'm going to read in the Bible today is that God is saying, come home. You can be here with my people. You can be here to learn more about me. You can be here to experience my love. And what we as Christian people need to try to do when we're out in the world is to live our lives in a way that says to people that what we are as Christians is a pretty good thing. And so what God is saying for us to say, essentially, is... Come and join us. Come and be part of what we are. Come and enjoy learning about God, learning about Jesus, learning to be a part of the church. So the church is a place like a home for our people. You know, it's our home as Christians. You know, and we are the church. The building isn't the church. We are the church. But it's like we're brothers and sisters in Christ, you see. And so as people who are Christian, we would like, you know, we should want other people to enjoy what we enjoy. We would want other people to be part of the faith and that kind of thing. So what I'm talking about today from the Bible is that God calls us to come home, to actually come to God's place, come to worship, come to be God's people. And that's an important thing. 
So, have you ever thought about sometime, maybe, you know, some of your friends that don't go to church saying, would you like to come to church? Or would you like to come to Sunday school? Maybe kind of bring that up sometime. You never know. They might. They might say yes. Because sometimes there are people out there who are searching and they want to know. But even if they don't come, you still treat them with love, treat them with respect, and be the Christian person you are. That's very important. Very important out there. So remember that, okay? And you go through the world and you live your life and you're talking to your friends and the ones that are around you. Remember that you represent God out there in the world. You do. And that you're to be a loving and caring person and be concerned about those who don't know about God. Be concerned about them and let them know that you care about them. You got it? Good deal. What's that prayer? God, we thank you for all the love that you share with us. And we thank you for how you have given us one another. You've given us as brothers and sisters in Christ here. And you've given us the church. You've given us the possibility of being people who grow in the faith and understand you more. Bless our children as they grow stronger. Help their parents to help them and help this church to teach them. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming up.
that. Lots of work put into that. From Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 through 9, hear the word of the Lord. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come and buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant. My steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the prophets, a leader and a commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. These are the words of our creator God. May God add a blessing to them. My prayer is that what I have to share with you today will strengthen you in your faith and encourage you in your, fa in your journey through life. The seeker and the nuns, the N-O-N-A-S's, have become two prominent words in church circles over the last few decades. In the past, terms like the Great Awakening or like revival were applied to the same type of phenomenon when those labels were applied, however, they made reference to people needing and wanting to become saved by Jesus Christ. People wanting to repent of their sin. People wanting to find the grace of God's salvation in their lives. In our time today, there's also this reawakening to the needs of the spiritual person, the person within. The difference is that now there are many choices that are being offered from many different faith communities and many different philosophies, and not all of them are based in Christianity. This awakening to the needs of the spiritual person has created a subculture of people who are in our midst, who are called seekers or unrelated to the church. They know they need something, but they are not quite sure what that something is, nor are they sure that the church even has it to offer. Psychologist John Roshan calls this phenomena a second journey into self. What he sees happening is that many Americans have moved into a mode of appraising self while at the same time also moving out toward others. The result, particularly among baby boomers, my age group, and maybe Generation Xers and maybe Millennials, is that we've become a people who are revising our understanding of ourselves 
and of our own spiritual needs. So we are beginning to realize that there is a need to reach out and commit ourselves to something, maybe any, even anything of importance. In Roshan's own words, he writes, this balanced care for self and others brings out virtues of connectedness, intimacy, love, fairness, and a sense of justice and commitment to duty which yearn to be reclaimed in the lives of many. Fulfillment versus responsibility and individual ambition versus the needs of others are at the crux of this dilemma. It certainly is a crisis among the baby boomers, if you will, and it appears to me to be overflowing into the following generations as well. So we have quickly become a nation of seekers. We have become a people who want to know that our lives count for more than just earning a paycheck, more than just having things, more than just enjoying the so-called good life. We've become that way because we are learning that the good life is full of emptiness, lacks staying power, and not too terribly exciting in the end anyway. It is often depressing. So we have become people who live now in what is called the age of anxiety. And you see it in our politics, you see it reflected in the way people talk and the way people act. We live in the age of anxiety as, as much as we have, as, as much as we own, as much as our bank accounts pile up, we are living in the age of anxiety. It is often depressing and in the end very costly. And who can afford that? People take pills to get rid of it now. The common perception that has evolved in our thinking over the last couple decades is that we are all generally roaming in a spiritual wilderness and in some cases following as the Eagles, the singing group, the Eagles sang in one of their songs, following the wrong God's home. we are also beginning to find that by wandering around in our wilderness, we are depriving ourselves of the really good stuff. We are realizing that in so many areas of our lives, there is so much richness that has gone untapped within each of us and has not been appreciated, not necessarily by others, but by we ourselves. Somehow, we each really know that all this potential resides within us, at the very core, the very bones of our being. Don't you feel it? You know, there's something in you that's alive, something that's there that hasn't really fully come out, something somehow you'd like to have it come out, and you'd like to be the, the more the stronger person than you have been, the more the faith-filled person than you have been. And so we seek to answer, we seek the avenues, I'm saying, that will allow expression of all that that we inherently know resides within us. But as I said previously, there are so many avenues promising fulfillment in our world today. Where does a seeker turn? God, our creator, reaches out and says simply to all of humanity, come home, come to me. I am your God. I am the one who made you. I am the one who loves you. This is the only one invitation in all the world that really makes sense for everyone who is roaming in a spiritual wilderness. God Yahweh, Adonai Elohim, the one true God that ever was, ever has been, and always will be. Throughout Isaiah 55, God has extended that invitation. He says, Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Incline your ear and come to me. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let them return to the Lord. This one chapter alone, Isaiah 55, is fraught with God's desire to receive each and every person into God's loving and caring arms. When this part of the book of Isaiah was written, this particular chapter, the Hebrew people had been the captives of Babylon 
which is modern-day Iraq. They had been the captives of Babylon for 400 years. Memory of what was home had faded. You could well imagine how that might happen over the course of four centuries. If you took a bunch of Americans and you took them some other place in the world and you kept them there for four centuries, they might forget what America was about, what it was like. 400 years. The Hebrews were losing their identity and fading into the fabric of the Babylonian culture. The prophets knew the Hebrews needed an awakening to the fact that they had a future and that they would not always be captives. And therefore, they had to keep alive the hope, keep alive the vision of a reunited Israel. And they were saying to their people, if we can't physically come home where we belong, then we can at least spiritually come home and be whom we really are. It was written for a generation that had never seen Israel, never seen the Holy Land, but for a generation who had been called to a vision that one day Israel would again be a nation. Though captive, they had to keep the dream alive because some future generation born of the slaves of Babylon would be Israel once more. So they needed to keep the dream alive. In our country, there are American Indian nations who, when they make decisions as a tribe based upon their decisions, they, they base them upon what effects those decisions will have on seven generations to come. Now, if you, if you make a generation 20 years, that's 140 years. They're thinking that far ahead. The tribe thinks that way. The Native American tribes think that way because they think that way about how what they do now will affect the lives of the people then, people that they will not even know because they'll be dead. They do so because they do know, though, that one day they will be the ancestors that those following generations will either revere or will curse as a result of the decisions that they made. What we do to or for future generations is a heavy responsibility. And the American Indian tribes look at it that way. Hmm. In the present moment, it is time for us who are Christian to be saying to this current generation of seekers, it's time for us to be saying, come home. However, just as in the case of the captive Israelites, we must be careful that we do not fade so much, fade so much into the fabric of our culture, forgetting whom we are ourselves. We must make the conscious decision to keep the vision alive so that those seeking God beyond our generation are not disappointed in what we have done. I mean, you are Christians now because there have been 2,000 years of people before us who kept the story alive, who brought it down to us, who kept the Bible almost exactly like it was written, only not in English, Hebrew and Greek, but the words are there, who found it so important that they took care of it, they believed in it, and they wanted you to know it. The traditionally mainline Protestant churches, such as we are, have not been popular churches over the last 50 years. Our kind of church overall has shown a decline in numbers. A decline in numbers, I su submit, because we are faithful. Faithful to the word. We're not popular. We do what's right. What God would see as right. What Jesus would see as right. And that's not always popular with the culture. But a depressed attitude is even filtered into some of our congregations because they remember the good old days when there were hundreds more in their churches, when there were 500 people in Sunday school and all that. Well, the good old days on Sundays, what happened? Nothing but church. You didn't have all the other things that go on on Sundays. No stores were open on Sundays. If you, that's what you're remembering, how the church was in the good old days, it was that way because there was nothing else to do on Sundays. For those who are unattached to a church, 
the people called seekers, there are many temples, many temples to which they may run today, and not all of those temples truly honor God or even think about God. Our time is different than previous eras. It's different today than it was then. There are, however, still those who are seeking as they were before and they are now, and we must be intentional about reaching out to them and about being here when they come calling at our doors. It serves no good purpose to be stuck in a time warp, remembering what the church used to be. We must deal with whom we are now at this moment and yet remain a faithful church at any cost. As a pastor, God has helped me make peace with the fact that unlike in the past times, not everyone is going to see the church as presenting the answers to their needs. That's hard for me to understand, but it's the truth. In spite of that, I, can, I now realize that God calls me to be faithful to the gospel, to keep the doors of the church open to all people, to keep the congregations that I have served and am serving in my lifetime focused on the faith. And why? Because the day will come when the church and everything for which it now stands will again seem more relevant to everyone. There will come a day, if not today, when this generation of pastors and congregants whose job has been to keep the word of God alive and to keep the church doors open for succeeding generations, when it will finally be able to look beyond the church itself, see the people who are truly seeking, and call, them to, call to them saying, come home. This is where you belong because you're God's children. That day is today. And we are the generation you are the church. I am the church. As the song says, we are the church together. You, for you awaits a generation of people out there who need what we offer, who need Jesus in their lives. They are seeking. They want a spiritually fulfilling life. They do not want a church with politic problems within it. They do not want phony sincerity. They do want the real thing. And you know who they are. They are your friends, they are your neighbors, they are members of your family, just like I was talking to the kids, the kids you go to school with. They want a spiritually fulfilling life, as you do. They need to hear you say, come home. They need to hear you say, God can be found dwelling with the people of our church in this building, in this place, every Sunday morning. Our lives are sometimes filled with discontent wrongly directed and frivolously spent on things not fulfilling. That is typical America. Really. We spend a lot of time on a lot of phony things in our nation. God, however, calls us to be, to be part of a more fulfilling way of life. God is calling us and all those who are seeking something more in their lives. He's calling us to be where we belong with the people of God, sharing the faith, working together to make it spread. William Thompson wrote a hymn that you're going to sing with which I'm sure many of you are familiar. And it has many verses and many versions, but you'll note that I've changed one word in it. He wrote softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you, calling to you and to me. Patiently, Jesus is waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O seeker, instead of O sinner, O seeker, come home. Are you a seeker? then you've come to the right place. Do you, dear Christian friend, know someone who is seeking? Then you need to be their guide. God has proclaimed through Isaiah, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Don't thirst any longer. Come to where it is. Come to the fountain. It's time for those who seek a new understanding in their lives to come home to Christ and to Christ's people. That's where it's at. 
This faith hasn't survived for 2,000 years. It survived a lot of countries. A lot of nations have risen and fallen. A lot of kings have been kings and died. A lot of countries have had constitutions and things and written them and come and gone. A lot of them have had revolutions and it happened. And I bet if I ask you, you could not tell me the name of every one of our presidents. Or what number is the president we have right now? But what is it? 45, 44, 43, what? 44? <laughs> Had to talk about it, didn't you, to figure it out? But you do know the name of Jesus. There are 165 plus nations around the world. We have, Arab, we have bases in probably 160 of them. Do you know the names of those countries? But you know the name of Jesus. There are all kinds of presidents of all kinds of nations in the world. Do you know who any of them are? Can you name the president of France? Surely somebody can. Germany? Prime Minister of England? David Cameron? but you know the name of Jesus. What's really important? If it's important, you know it. So the name of Jesus must be important. The seekers are looking. Some are looking for something easy, and that's really what most people look for, something that's easy. Being truly a Christian is not easy. It's thoughtful, it's deep, it's pondering, it's important stuff. It's not about me, myself, and I, and how good I feel about me, myself, and I. It's about serving the risen Savior, Jesus the Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, which we are thinking about through the Lenten season who went to that cross so that we might have life and have life more abundantly, shed his own blood on that cross and died a wicked death that we might live. The seekers are looking. Some are looking for something either easy, but others, however, are looking for something, they're looking for something that's real. And there could be no other faith as real as this one. Our prophet died to prove that. The only one who did. And the only one who was resurrected from death to live again. Let us not fail those who are seeking. Let us not fail our God and helping to end their quest to find their home. A world awaits, and we have the answer. Live your life so that others might know. Christ died for our sins. God loves us, and God cares for us all. Would you pray with me? During this Lenten season, God, it is an amazing grace that you have extended to us, a grace that allows us to be free, free in spirit, free in mind, whole and well. And so, God, as we go through this Lenten season, help us to be mindful of our call to serve you out in the world. It's too long that Christians have been staring at their own belly buttons and thinking about their own feelings and how okay or not okay they are. It's time for Christians to realize, God, that this is a living faith, that it's a faith that needs to flourish, a faith that needs to be spread, a faith that needs to be shared, a faith that needs to be lived. And the only time that the spiritual being will ever be fully complete is when each one of us realizes that, that this faith is not about only me. This faith is about you. 
and where I am in relation to you. And so today we pray, God, if there's anybody who's not feeling like they're in the right place with you, that they'd rethink that sense of whom they are. We pray that Jesus' death would not have been in vain for any of us, but would have, in fact, been something that has brought us to our knees and helped us to realize that, God, you are the one who cares the most about anything and everything there is, and to you we should be turning. Forgive us of our sin, our sin of omission when we haven't done the thing that we should have done, and our sins of commission, the sins that we have committed that were wrong and should not have ever been done. Help us to move forward in our lives instead of taking step backwards. Help us to see that there's a faith, a living faith, that calls us out into the world, out into a beautiful future, out into a, a wonderful way of life, and out on into eternity living with you. And help us not only talk about it, but believe it and live it. We pray this morning that you'd be in our community, be among our different churches we have here. Be with the pastors of those churches who struggle wanting to share the faith. Be with this community as a body, those that are church and those that are unchurched. Watch over us and may your spirit brood over this, con this community and this congregation and all the congregations in such a way that the people begin to understand, God, that there's more that they need in their lives. Be with our teachers, our schools, and all who are in it and watch over them. Help us to be faithful and faith-filled people. And then we pray, God, as we're in the midst of this election season for a new president, we just pray that you'd watch over everybody who calls himself or herself a candidate and that you would speak to them in strong and living tones to help them know it's not just this country that they serve. It's you. So help us, God, to be a better people and help us to honor you. Be with those who serve our country in faraway lands. Watch over them. Be with those who are watching us by television and are not able to leave their bed. Or maybe they are and they're struggling with their spirit. They're struggling with their faith. Be with them and help them know that we care about them too. Bless us, God, we pray. Continue to bless us. And we pray this in the holy name of Jesus, your Son, our Savior, who taught us that we may pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Giving of what you have is a spiritual discipline. It is for all Christians. Not only do we have just the gifts that come from our work, from our paychecks, but we have the giving of our time, we have the giving of our talents. The three T's, time, talent, and treasure, are important. And all of those things go together and they merge to make the church successful and to make the word of God known throughout the world. So what you give today does that. What you share of your wealth, what you share of your time, what you share of your, of your um, treasures and talents does make a difference. So give to God and bless God with your gift.
Thank you, God, for the ability to share in your work. We're able to give of what we have, and we're still able to live. We're still able to pay our bills. We're still able to make a difference in our families' lives and still help the church. So bless these gifts brought to this table and brought to this place to glorify you and to praise you and to help do your work in the world. May we have the intelligence, the wisdom, the skills to use it in ways that are honoring you and glorifying you and strengthen your church. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, your son, with gratitude in our hearts. Amen. Thank you. We have a call in this world to go out and serve our risen Savior, to be the people of the book, the people of the faith, the people who have the one prophet who died for his people and was resurrected from the dead. We are called to be the living faith, embodiment of the faith. We are called to be the church. So go out into the world and be the church and call others to be part of that as well. Go out in the world and serve where you can serve and do the best that you know how to do with your life. Love others, be kind and compassionate, 
And God won't slight you for that. God will see how you try. And because of that, there will come a day when God's face will shine on you and God will grant you peace. Amen.